in the Caribbean, uh, the Malvinas, uh, which, uh, or whatever they, are, they call it, is a good indication of how they have done it. Of course, it doesn't belong to either one. It doesn't belong to uh, Argentina, and it certainly doesn't belong to uh, England, but the people to whom it belong are now since dead. You know, they, the they've, been, they've been liquidated to the last man. People are talking about Holocaust. I mean, that's a Holocaust. Nobody left. Holocaust in Tasmania, not a single person left. Now, the Holocaust in Southern Africa, uh, Munamatapa, when uh, this man was brought from India, uh, uh, Lugard, Captain Lugard, and he had I I exterminated Indians, then they brought him to South Africa, Cecil John Rhodes. He liquidated millions of Africans, I would say about at least 20 to 30 million Africans with the attempt to match Cairo with the Cape. All right, let me, let me interrupt and stop you at this moment. That leads into a, a, the discussion that awaits us with mm -hmm. Professor Clark. We will continue with Professor Clark of Hunter College right after this. In the portion of the preceding segment, you heard Professor Ben raise the question of the Holocaust, which seems uh, of a Holocaust, an African Holocaust. Seldom is that word used in that particular context. We've only heard Holocaust used in a particular uh, context. Maybe we can ex amplify on that. Well, our Holocaust started 500 years ago, and it's not over yet. In fact, our relationship with Europe has been a continuous Holocaust, and we have been continuously resisting uh, that Holocaust. African resistance to this Holocaust started in the hinterlands of Africa when he was revolting to keep from being taken to the shore and continued along the shore when he revolted to keep from getting on the boats, continued on the boats and he revolted to keep from getting off of the boats. Forced off the boats, he continued to revolt on the, on the land. But the apex of this resistance, uh, while coming in the 19th uh, century, but slave revolts uh, had started there was a slave revolt in Cuba as early as 1525. Um, and these slave revolts mostly led by people called Maroons, and this is a term really means runaway. These slaves who bypassed the auction block many times and went into the hills and, and defied people to en enslave them and formed separate societies. Why, the best known of these societies are in Jamaica and, and Haiti, but there were maroon societies all over the so-called New World, including um, here in the, in, in the United States. You know, I found out, Professor Clark, that uh, my, when my ancestors were maroons in Jamaica. Well, you're from royalty then, the uh, fighting nobility, as I often say uh, about my sharecropper parents in Alabama. I am from the peasant nobility. <laughs> <laughs> well, from one noble to another, good to talk to you. <laughs> and um, it is left for us to declare what we are. And we say that these people who, who fought um, so that other generations can live uh, is of uh, revolutionary royalty. Let, let, let me press you a little bit on the dimensions of our Holocaust. Mm -hmm. what, what, numerically, what what numbers are we talking about? We heard uh, Professor Ben talk about 10, 20 million lives, African lives, taken in the Holocaust. I would say the figure is rather conservative um, when uh, you consider that in the movement from the coast, from, from the hinterland to the coast, every 10 captured, less than three got to that coast. And so we have now figures that's kind of lost forever from the computer. And many times, if you look at the logs of the slave ships, they might load on 300 and not make any stops. And when they finally get to the main port of debarkation, you have less than 200. So that's all, oh, that so many went overboard, so many died of suffocation. But now, what we need to concentrate on is that, that fight on the land, the maroon revolts, the different slave revolts in, in Haiti, Jamaica, the Babish revolt in Guyana, uh, Feather Van Sertemans, uh, uh, a country that there was continuous revolts all over the Caribbean area and in South America. And in South America, 
they not only large numbers of Africans bypassed the slave, bypassed the auction block, went into the hinterlands and found separate nations, Us Palmares and uh, and um, and uh, Bahia. These are separate African nations uh, carved out in Brazil itself. And now these revolts in the Caribbean would stimulate uh, black revolting here in in the United States. But when we look at the 19th century, we look, have to look at the whole of the African world in revolt. The Africans in Africa, them, in, in Africa began uh, a series of wars that would last over 100 years. The Ashanti Wars, the Asante Wars, and what is now Ghana started in 1805. The last war was fought in 1901, led by a great African woman warrior, Ye Asante War. The Zulu Wars would last far more than that. The wars against the uh, coming of the Europeans started in 1652 when the Europeans arrived. The last war in Southern Africa was 1906. In between our, uh, our breaks, uh, you were mentioning um, in the dimension of the Holocaust, the experience of a particular group. Oh, I was talking about the Herero War and what is now Namibia then formerly called Southwest Africa. The Germans tried to create a bastard race in this area by cohabiting with the Herero women. What they did not understand is that culturally, the Herero woman never cohabits outside of her tribe or, or her group, not even with another African. And traditionally, she makes every attempt to bring virginity to her wedding bed. And if she is violated before marriage, it's all one can do to keep her from committing suicide because she has lost her womanness and have nothing to give to a man. The Germans would drive almost 60,000 of these women out in the Kahalahar Desert and say, cohabit or die. And an old king, Mandume, called the Mambas and the Herreros and all the different groups together and said that, in essence, if we let this happen to our women, we are no longer men. We are proud people. We walk the earth carrying the sun on our shoulders. And if this happens to our women without our rescuing them, we are no longer men. We will have to take off the trousers and take care of the children and milk the cows and bring in the bread. And our women will no longer respect us uh, as men. He took about 300,000 people into this war. He lost a third of them, mm. but he rescued those women. It was the honor of that people. and. I never forget his beautiful word that uh, if we fail in this mission, we will have to put down the sun from our shoulders and the world will be in darkness. Because we are men, we light up the world. Mm. Does it therefore follow that across the continent of Africa, there were um, coalitions of African people who organized militantly to resist this encroachment called slavery. Not only that, but came together a little better then than they're doing right now, incidentally or sadly. Um, in the uh, Sudan, there were wars uh, stimulated by Islam, led by a man called Muhammad uh, uh, Ahmad, uh, the Mahdi, of uh, the holy man, holy, wo uh, uh, holy man. These wars were, were uh, lasted from about 1860, uh, to um, the death of the Mahdi in 1885. Then another Mahdi took over, uh, Khalifa Abduhaya, and he was defeated by Kitchener. Um, and uh, as uh, when he was defeated after 11 years of the independence, this war was reported by a young British reporter named Winston Churchill, and his book on it is called The River War. And he said that, um, you know, um, he boasted of killing 50,000 people one evening. See, when we talk about mm -hmm. our Holocaust, 
I guess people should talk about